Uh, welcome to our American Musa community gathering. Uh, this is our second week of exploring the soul trait of humility. And we're exploring it, you know, at least partially within the context of chesed, the Jewish value of giving and supporting others without expecting anything in return. We'll get started the way we always do with a short meditation. I invite you to sit back and relax and take in a deep breath through the nose and hold and exhale through the mouth and hold. And again, inhale through the nose and hold and exhale through the mouth and hold. And as you go at your own pace of inhaling through the nose and holding and exhaling through the mouth and holding, if thoughts should come into your head, just observe them and let them pass, like watching a car pass by on the road. Now is not the time for solving problems. All you need to do is inhale through the nose and hold and exhale through the mouth and hold. And on your next inhale, say to yourself, Shema. And on the exhale, listen. Shema. Listen. In Shema, we're listening deeply, without judgment, without offering advice. In Shema, we are listening with an open heart. Shema, listen. And when you're ready, you may open your eyes. Hi, Marianne, welcome. All right, well, I was gonna talk about this at the end, but since we've already talked about it with many of you, I will just show it. I was on a Jewish website earlier today, and what do I see but an advertisement from Audible with my audiobook like right there. So mm -hmm. that was pretty fun. Mm -hmm. Mazel tov. Yes. <laughs> Ashikoach. Yes. Okay. okay. So that's my moment of humility for, for today. <laughs> We're going to get started with this quote, um, which I think relates maybe a little bit to <laughs> what, we, what we discussed last week. But may I have a volunteer to unmute and uh, read this this little snippet? When God asks Adam Ayeka, where are you? God is also asking, who are you? Are you ready for your mission? Adam's reply, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I am naked and hid myself. Makes clear that Adam is not ready. He is hiding his truth. Rabbi Michelle Perlman and Rabbi Sharon Mars, the Musa Torah Commentary. Thank you. Yeah, so um, Rabbi Mars and Rabbi Perlman, um, what are they, um, what is the point that they're making? What are they arguing here? And if anyone has any questions about the story. Yes, Sue and then Marjorie. Okay, I'll start. Well, I th I find it funny <laughs> that he said he's, so it says he's naked, but he's hiding. 
So that's kind of like an oxymoron when you think about it, because when you're naked, mm -hmm. you're showing everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I don't know, that struck me, but he's hiding. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that he's afraid, he's hiding himself though, and he's not ready to show himself, even though he is naked. So the, the point is that we we must, um, you know, we we hear the call, but then um, to be ready and not hide yourself, to be out there and to stand up for what you believe in. That's what I get from it. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Marjorie and then Paul. I was actually just kind of pointing to words, but trying to like understand what this meant. But oh. after Sue's comment, I took it as um, he is, a, well, I, 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 he's afraid I don't take naked is literally, I think I, I took it as he is still, um, he's not prepared. He's just not prepared to, to, to uh, face God, mm. face reality. He's just not ready for what is expected of him. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one clarification in this story, in this part of the story, he is literally naked. He and it's right after he eats from the tree of knowledge and realizes that he's naked and then is also afraid of, you know, and he hears hears God and he's afraid that he's going to be in trouble. So he uh, he does sort of cover himself and hides and you know, could he, that be could that have could that have two meanings absolutely you know, he's naked literally but he's also still feeling like you know because he's just been created i mean he's probably so unprepared for what's ahead of him yeah but i mean i you know who knows what the torah you know we could sit and talk torah for for a while <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You could spend thousands of years talking about Torah. Oh, wait, we have spent thousands of years talking about Torah. <laughs> Paul. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm thinking of um, being afraid because I'm naked um, and this happening shortly after he eats from the tree of knowledge that um, there's something about when you are, when I, you know, am exposed to, to new knowledge about myself or about my reality, um, that oftentimes, if I'm open to it, will create a sense of not shame, but vulnerability because I, you know, there's, there's new things that I'm now aware of and I don't really know, I'm still processing them myself and i'm not sure whether what my exposure and my thoughts based on that exposure mm -hmm. i'm not sure how they would um sound to you know to god uh or to you know anybody else so that's kind of my take on it is maybe a bit more human uh view of it thanks thank you paul and i love kind of bringing in the, the vulnerability aspect and the vulnerability when we learn something new and we're still processing and integrating it. Yeah, absolutely. Janet. Uh, I can't help thinking about that movie, Oh God, with George Burns and <laughs> John Denver and God says, I created you. What do you think? I don't know what you look like. <laughs> Me. This is all about self, it's, it's partially is, is it about self-acceptance, really. Mm. Adam, Adam does not know who he is. God knows who he is, mm -hmm. but Adam does not. Yeah, self-acceptance. <laughs> Love it, thank you. I'm Joanne. Yeah, well, I hate to offer Torah commentary, but I mean, Adam knows he did the wrong thing you know he really does uh somewhere in him because he had one thing he was not supposed to eat and he ate that hmm. and he tries to pass it off on eve of course and so 
So that's why he's hiding. He's hiding his truth because he doesn't want to say God. Oh, I messed up. You know, mm. <laughs> from the tree of life. Yeah, knowledge, whatever. Yeah. Well, so he is. Hide. Yeah, he is hiding, and he's hiding. You know, it is. In a sense, it reminds me of kind of what you were saying last week, and what a number of people were saying, talking about the humility and chesed and dealing with people like I wrote about uh, today or dealing with people who aren't don't reciprocate or who are not are difficult to deal with. And, you know, I think in a sense, he's not occupying his space. He's hiding. He's shrinking. He's not ready to face the consequences of what of what he did. Linda and Frank. Is the actual interpretation the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Yeah. So not just the tree of knowledge, but yes, that's that's part of the picture as well. Okay. Yeah. Was there more to is was there something behind the question as well, or just a curiosity about the the story? Well, yes, <laughs> I think about <clears throat> all the opportunities to write midrash because there's just so much that isn't said. Mm. Like, like was Adam taught what what's appropriate and what isn't, or did he just get in trouble for? doing something that he shouldn't have done. Did he know he sh shouldn't have done it? No, that's all I'm done. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's interesting the way these rabbis pull in this connection to personal mission too. You know, it's like, where are you? Who are you? You know, as Janet said, God, God knows the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. But do we know the answer? And then um yeah bonnie um in my mind it's the difficulty of picking up that thousand pound mirror and looking at it and saying what's my part in this what did i do mm. and i think it's human that it's very hard to pick up that mirror mm. and so i'm not ready to be so angry with adam at all I think we need to empathize. What I need to empathize. I can't speak for other people. <laughs> well, well said. Yeah, thank you for your comment in the chat, Nancy. Did you want to? I'm guessing you shared that in the chat because you didn't want to talk out loud, but if you wanted to elaborate on that. Oh, I'm sorry. I just lost internet connection and had to run downstairs. So I lost uh, what anybody said. I came at the tail end of Bonnie. Um, no, it's just that um, I was taking it to kind of a metaphysical mm -hmm. point of view, which was more um, that there, because, um, yeah, uh, I don't know, you know, I mean, if we believe in Adam or whatever, but um, just that to me, it felt that we're afraid of showing who we really are. We're afraid of show because we don't know what our truth is. We don't know what our talents and our gifts are, which comes into a whole self-esteem and self-confidence issue. And then to be out there and feel comfortable, like other people have mentioned about vulnerability to, you know, feel comfortable enough to show the world. Uh, naked or not, <laughs> that this is who we are. We are special and divine in our each unique way. And um, so to me, it felt a little bit fear-based to present that to the world. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's kind of the flip side of it. You know, it's like, well, there's, you know, looking in the mirror and seeing our, our contribution and where we've missed that, but it's also inhabiting our, our divine nature and being able to kind of live with, yes, even though 
I make mistakes, um, I can be okay with myself and I can show the world who I really am. And I can show the world my gifts. I love that you brought all that to the table. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, so thank you. Okay, well, let, that was a great introduction. Let's go a little bit deeper. Okay, that goes here, this goes here. Okay, so we talked about the spectrum of humility. We touched on this last week. And when we came to this unit um, a couple years ago, um, Paul sent me this really interesting chart um, from Aristotle, who was one of the originators of this idea of kind of spectrum of virtues. And I think uh, this matched really well with uh, a quote from Maimonides, where he talked about uh, in his book, Eight Chapters, which is a wonderful book. Um, I have it here. It's one of my favorite books. It's his kind of introduction to Pierre Caillavot. It's a very good Musar book, very easy to Kind of some of his work can be pretty deep and philosophical. This is very dialed in and very practical. But he said, an example of a quality that leads to good deeds is temperance, a trait that lies midway between indulgence and asceticism. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, uh, if you talk about asceticism as insensibility and pleasure and pain and lists licentiousness, you know, this is kind of right, right out of Aristotle, where he was, he was trying to do a lot of what Maimonides was trying to do was um, kind of uh, create harmony between Greek philosophy and Jewish, Jewish teachings. And so um, I want to just pause here and see, like, given sort of what we've been talking about with you know, this idea of self-esteem and owning who we are and kind of living on the spectrum. The Maimonides quote, any any more thoughts? Or what did this bring up for you? Let's say sometimes I find something really interesting and then I share it and I realize I haven't, it's maybe not the best discussion prompt or I haven't asked it in a way that, that, that uh, invites conversation. So um, I have a feeling this might be one of those times. Joanne. Yeah, the, the one thing I, I was questioning when I saw this quote um, is because wasn't the temperance movement against drinking and why they use that word? And here, Maimonides has a sort of a middle road um, between licentiousness and asceticism. Whereas I think the temperance movement, they were way out on the asceticism side of it. Yeah, um, I, I think. I, I don't know why the temperance movement was called the temperance movement. And it is a little a little hard to make that connection. Maybe it had to do with sort of withholding, you know, withholding things. But Maimonides wrote in Arabic, which then got translated into Hebrew, which then got translated into English. So mm -hmm. there's probably not a one-to-one -one correspondence between mm -hmm. all of those meanings as you mm -hmm. as you kind of observe. Paul. Well, I, I just opened up uh, my my uh, Merriam-Webster definitions of temperance. So temperance, I think, was hijacked by the uh, prohibition uh, movement because temperance is defined as moderation in action, thought, or feeling, or, or restraint. So that's more mm -hmm. along the of how uh, Maimonides is, is uh, 
looking at that. And mm -hmm. uh, so what I really am loving about what you just presented is it reminds me of something that I've been experiencing in the last uh, month or so. So I've been meditating a lot. I've been using a particular app and that's been very helpful. Uh, I've also been listening to a podcast about uh, Buddhist uh, thought and teachings. And um, the one that I was listening to um, just uh, the last few days is all about loving kindness, you know, as being something to really meditate upon. And I like this convergence, you know, sometimes this happens where there's a convergence of different threads in my life and they come together and they really reinforce each other. So um, I think that what I would, my thoughts about this, about what you show was that regardless of our genealogy or historical background, we are looking for some way to help guide our, uh, our thoughts and behavior and how we re relate to our world uh, mm -hmm. in a useful way. And, you know, Ben Franklin came up with things and uh, uh, mm -hmm. Sar, we've got, you know, Greek philosophers who were thinking about this a long time ago and probably people before that never really put it down into writing, you know, before the written word was really applied to that. So uh, to me, this represents how we're always looking for ways to guide ourselves and things to really consider and meditate upon. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. All right, let's see. Mm -hmm. um i would like to yeah i'm going to take us towards once again the breakout groups um because okay. i thought that worked well last week to get to them early So there's a little bit of a story here. And maybe to begin with, someone can read the um read this story. And what uh you know, I was really happy when Nancy kind of brought the word self-esteem <clears throat> to in our conversation at the opening, because mm -hmm. for the the role with your partner, the discussion with your partner is what is the role of self-esteem in practicing chesed? Okay, and so here is, and to talk about that kind of maybe in the context of this, this story. So could someone um, unmute and read this, please? Hi, I could read it. Okay, what is the, what, what is the role of self-esteem in practicing Hesit? Avi said, how can you talk to us about self-esteem? I've been in and out of jail half my 34 years. I've been a thief since I was eight. When I'm out of jail, my family doesn't want to see me. I answered, think about how a diamond looks when it comes out of the ground, a lump of dirty ore. It takes work to bring out its intrinsic beauty. We are all like that dirt covered ore. It is our job mm -hmm. to find the diamond and polish until it grows. Rabbi Tversky, do unto others how good deeds can change your life. Tversky went on to describe how Avi turned his life around. Yeah, thank you. And he was describing a group in Israel he was leading at a halfway house. Five, seven, and, uh, didn't answer. Seven. You've reached the voicemail of extension number 3117. Please. So I actually went and ordered myself a copy of this book, which is available really cheaply used um, mm -hmm. online. So that looked interesting to me. So yeah, in your groups, you know, sort of talk about this idea of, of the role of the interaction of self-esteem and chesed. So let me get the breakout rooms here.
Okay, the rooms are open. Twenty years. All right, welcome back, everyone. So I would love to kind of hear about your discussions. Oh, oh geez. Sorry, that was the cat who successfully <laughs> jumped on my lap and clawed my leg. Um, so, as I was saying, who would like to share? Paul. Yeah, um, Sue and I had a great conversation about this, and uh, it was, uh, you know, Sue brought up something which got us talking about when we are going to... Uh, I visit somebody or in my case you know it was sort of a christmas thing because i grew up with with christmas that um when we are getting ourselves ready for that that period of time with the other person um you know sometimes you know i will stress out about getting the perfect gift or get the worth getting the perfect gifts and uh you know for me it means on christmas eve five o'clock I'm still running around stores trying to find just like the the thing that would be the extra spark that will really you know put it put them over the edge and um Sue had a different experience but still the, the commonality was why are we stressing about this when is it enough mm -hmm. and it was about um for me it's about uh you know not feeling like even just bringing myself and a modest gift was enough I needed all the other things mm. sort of hide the fact that it, that I'm just me, that somehow all the other material things that I was bringing would somehow mollify them for it being just me. Mm. And that's where the self-esteem kind of comes in, whereas the loving kindness being there and present, if I'm so stressed out about maybe I didn't find the extra sparkle thing and I'm still thinking about it when I'm with the person, well, then I'm not really there with them. And Sue had a, a slightly different take on it, but it was, you know, that was the comment. And Sue, you, please speak up, you know, because I thought yours was a really good example as well. I, I think you covered okay. it perfectly. I, okay. I just had an ex a different example of visiting um, a sick friend and um, bringing some something and I had already decided, but then I wanted to get more. <laughs> and I was like, well, <laughs> you know, and I'm trying to actually the homework from last week, my, what I wanted to do was, um, I wrote this down, self-care by setting boundaries. Mm. So that's what I was trying to do. And I said to myself, um, well, you haven't really done that this week. You haven't done the self-care. And then I said, well, today I'm going to see this friend and I, and I'm trying Instead of just the challah bread, I want to get them a plant and all these other things. And I and then I said, what am I doing? I don't need to go mm. the extra. Um, you know, it's enough. And that's where we came into that great conversation about, you know, what is enough and why am I doing it? Do I, you know, I didn't really want the reward, but maybe I felt like I needed to somehow give them all these things. You know, so that was what that was about. Yeah, well, thank you both so much for sharing um, well, from a place of real, real vulnerability. And I can really, I can really relate to that. Yeah, and that's very powerful. Like if we don't feel like we're enough, if I, what I'm hearing is if we don't feel like we're enough, then we're trying to kind of like overdo it on the gift giving front. And then all of a sudden we're not actually appreciating the gift of our presence. And we're not even really present if we're just constantly ruminating on, oh, are they going to like what I gave? And do I need to plant too? And wow, I love that. Thank you so much. Martin. That's, uh, in our group, uh, we talked about uh, with good self-esteem, uh, then there's a good chance we'll have a better judgment when we're interacting with others. That's basically what we talked about. So can... hmm. Yeah, better judgment. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other other thoughts, other insights that came up. Yes, Marjorie. Um, we talked about self-esteem versus self-confidence, right? Mm. Like somebody in my um and it kind of comes down to self-love. Self-esteem is like you better have, you know, really like yourself and know what you're getting before you um before you get into a situation where you could be challenged you know you're talking about people that 
challenge you. Um, like you, it's kind of what I took away. Mm -hmm. Just really knowing yourself. Yeah. Really like yourself, you know, stand, you know, just take, take a few minutes before you get into a situation and just know where you're coming from before you go forward yeah. with a challenging situation. Thank you. Thank you. Being in the, the job market right now and doing a lot of reaching out to people, it's it's brought up things for me. It's made me realize just how vulnerable the position is, even though I'm okay, you know, but just this is one of those situations where mm -hmm. we all can find some spot that we can be put in where we're going to, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. And this one is, is challenging for me and a lot of watching the email and wondering, did I write the right thing? And should I have said something different? And noticing, wow, I'm spending a lot of cycles, you know, circling on on this stuff, which really isn't necessary to circle on. And I need to be okay with that too, you know, okay with, all right, so we're spending a few extra mental cycles on this, okay? So it's really helpful for me to be reminded of the cost of that as well. You know, that's energy that's not being spent on the people I'm with or on other things. And it's easier, sometimes it's easier for me to kind of move towards something positive than to try to avoid something that's negative. You know, stop ruminating on this. Isn't this helpful? <laughs> okay, let's focus on like, hanging out with this person right now or reading a book or something positive. Yeah, Sue. Just was thinking about what you said and I, I really resonated with that. It's like, it's the, it's, um, it's a kind of a cost of too, too much time spent on this one thing. And I think that kind of also goes back to the priorities in your day. I mean, we have, X amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes find myself like, okay, social media, I just, and it's terrible, <laughs> especially now. I mean, I'm just like constantly and like, okay, we have to stop ourselves and move on. And that's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if that has anything to do with what we're talking about, but, but what you said reminded me of that, of the, of how we spend our time. And mm -hmm. there's a cost to that. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Social media is its own thing. You know, I I can't even begin to guess at how many like PhD thesis have been written about social media. And, you know, there's been st a recent study about social media and teenagers and self-esteem. So I think it is mm -hmm. Bonnie who shared before many of us got here that she had a commitment and needed to leave early. But, you know, her phrase about the thousand pound mirror or oh, social media is kind of a distorted mirror I think of like what the world looks like and you know how it can leave us feeling like we can't measure up to this person who's always on the perfect vacation and whatever and uh mm. yeah well yeah um this reminded me of something else that Sue and I talked about, which is that um, if we are not able to apply loving kindness to ourselves, then that makes it very difficult to, for me anyway, my experience is if I can't do that to myself, if I can't be loving, kind, loving and kind to myself, how can I really, do, I can pretend to do it with other people. But I mean, to be very genuine, and as we were saying before about being present for the other person, I can't can't really do that effectively. So in some ways, uh, going back to the polishing the uh, the rough diamond into something to find, you know, the, the gleaming things inside, um, that that's, I think, where we apply loving kindness to ourselves, where we take the time, it takes effort to uncover, to remove impurities, to find the um 
the the beauty within uh, a diamond. And I think we spend I, I spent you know most of my life trying to find where that is. I, I've had a feeling it's there somewhere since I was a kid, but uh, it was so layered over with other things. So um, now I'm feeling more confident. I have self-esteem, better self-esteem that's based in that loving kindness having been applied to myself so that I can be there and 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 uh, I think be a better mensch, you know, for, mm -hmm. in the world. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Amen to that. We're all striving to be a better mensch. <laughs> Joanne. Um, yeah, so... So I guess our group, um, we did speak a lot about, you know, the need for self-esteem and we were sort of wondering about self-confidence, if it's, if that's real or that's just a show, but real self-esteem and loving kindness to yourself. I think also I agree with Paul, it's, you can't really be kind to others if you can't be kind to yourself. And um, I think that our Musar practice helps, you know, with some of those rough spots and working on particular um, character traits that maybe need some work. And um, that's kind of where uh, we left it, I guess. Um, yeah. I think that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I think implicit about in what you said and what you know other people have shared is thinking about you know the traits interacting and you know applying chesed and kindness to ourselves can help heal our self esteem. Learn better self esteem lets us practice humility better, and it takes you know is healing a humility imbalance. Where okay, well. As the self-esteem gets better, I can occupy my space more. And I don't need to, going back to where we started with the who are you question and where are you and just being okay, you know, we don't need to hide who we are. You know, we don't need to hide our warts and we don't need to hide our accomplishments either and being okay. Feeling, yeah, we, I'm worthy. I'm worthy for, for this accomplishment, you know. I can be okay sharing uh, sharing the ad for my book that I came across that I was a little chuffed about, and I don't need to worry of people thinking I'm boasting too much or whatever. It's like you know, it's it's a fun thing. It's not any more or less than what it is. So, um, Karen. So as I listen to all of this, I have a thought that didn't happen before, and that is that who are you when it comes to self esteem? can maybe be answered by, I value myself and I know that I matter. Mm -hmm. And if we believe that we matter, then what we do matters. Yeah. Giving too little, giving too much, because we feel insecure, vulnerable, because we're feeling more egotistical at the narcissistic you know, end of the scale. But if we don't feel like we matter, then it doesn't really matter if we're kind or not, or we look to do random acts or purposeful acts of kindness. Mm -hmm. But if we feel like we do matter and we are of value in society, then maybe acts of, ches of chesed really reflect that. Yeah. So that's my take for who are you as it relates to self-esteem and chesed. We yeah. are what matters. That's so powerful, Karen. Thank you. And it reminds me of kind of my own struggles with workaholism and some of that being related to low self-esteem and really like, and I remember, I can't remember, if, you know, writing in one of my books, you know, it's like no matter how much I worked, it could never fill that void. You know, it was not going to do that. And but filling that void in other ways just let me work, you know, in a more genuine way and do things to make a contribution. And so I think the same thing, this, 
you know, was making me think is if the self-esteem is low, you can do like thousand acts of chesed, but if you're doing them to try to fill that void, I don't know that it would ever be filled. I don't know that it would ever be filled. Um, as wonderful as it is to do those acts, they're um, turning that chesed internally and, and realizing that, you know, so powerful, I matter and what I do matters. Um, that's, wow, in some ways that feels like that's the whole show. Yeah. I've gone really deep here. You know, I have more um, readings that I could share, but I don't feel like going back into an intellectual analysis of, of a text is going to serve us right now. Karen. You're still on mute. All right, I'm going to take my hand down. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah, Toby. Well, um, going back to Karen's discussion of, of feeling like you matter, I read an article not, uh, oh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was a study of um, Gen Z and millennials regarding whether or not they thought they were going to vote. Hmm. And it, it it's, it's sort of centers around that same thing. The responses pretty much across the board. Well, well, they're, the two parties are pretty much the same. What what difference does it make if I vote or not? Which of course that's not what I want to hear. But um, I think it's interesting that younger people. But and this may not be across the board, but it just concerns this one issue. But I think if it concerns at the issue of voting, it might concern other issues that they don't feel that they matter and that what they do matters. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a concern for all of us. You know, I mean, maybe uh, just throwing that out there. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And one of the things that I do is I write letters to people who are infrequent voters and you know they say, why are you voting? And part of it is because I think it matters. And I think it is, you could look at it as a Musar practice of saying, yeah, I matter. And I'm gonna make that statement you know, by voting that I matter and my voice is, is, is going to be heard. And you could say, oh, it doesn't matter at all because I'm one of millions and tens and hundreds of millions of people or you could say it matters and I'm going to have my voice heard and the same act, you know, and I think by voting, you're voting for I matter. Well, friends, anyone who we haven't heard from today, would you like to just share or add a, add a comment? And if not, I think we'll start moving into our, our meditation. All right, so um, relax and close your eyes. Taking a deep breath through the nose and hold. And exhale through the mouth and hold. Just breathe in and out in a leisurely pace. <sighs> Notice the light that's filtering through your eyelids. This is the light of your divine spark. A diamond that's inside the unrefined ore. The ores are baggage, those hurts that we've accumulated. That light is that innocence, 
that internal goodness that's always there and always with us. It's that part that says, I matter. Allow yourself to hear that voice. I matter. I matter. And in this moment of quiet and peace, say that out loud to yourself. I matter. And together again, I matter. Allow your breathing to deepen once again. And wiggle your fingers. And when you're ready, you may open your eyes.